One of the challenges in preaching the Bible is that the Bible doesn't say what a lot of Christians think it says. Or even if a Christian does, in fact, read something in the Bible, what is written in the Bible might not mean exactly what the Christian thinks it means or what that Christian might want it to mean. One of the banes of my existence as a preacher is the fact that periodically I have to correct something that has been erroneously taught. Now, you may not think that's all that big a deal, but if the theological error has been posited by a beloved spiritual figure, some people feel that stating your disagreement with that figure is tantamount to desecrating their grave. Let me give you an example. I'm going to open a can of worms before I open an even bigger can of worms. And I'm not doing this because I'm a theological liberal or because I want to be disagreeable with any of you. In fact, I like most of you. (laughs) I'm doing this because I want you to know the truth. I don't have any piercings or tattoos. I know you came to church wanting to find that out about your pastor. But let me tell you why. First of all, I don't like pain. (laughs) Secondly, I don't like pain. Thirdly, you've probably never noticed, but I like everything that I put on to match. I wear monogrammed socks. Even at home when nobody else is around, my shirt has to match my pajama pants. It's the way I roll. And if my pajama, they come with cufflinks, it's all the better. So the idea that I would have green ink on my arm covered by a pink shirt might cause me to have a breakdown of sorts. So I don't do tattoos, it's it's just not my thing. But it's something that a lot of people like, and a lot of you guys like them. But when a Christian doesn't like tattoos, he goes to Leviticus 19.28. The Bible says, You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead, or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. And so they think, well, there's that verse, it has the word tattoo, so that's got to be the thing. And I know that they will oftentimes use that verse to beat up a brother or sister because he or she got tatted. I never wanted to get tattoos. In my generation, and some of you can relate to this, in my generation, tattoos were symbols of rebellion or time in the armed forces. You either had to be in the Marines or in the Hells Angels to warrant having a tattoo, really. And I never wanted any. There were a lot more rebellious things that seemed to be a whole lot more fun than the pain of getting my arm nailed with needles. But the only thing that I can say as a Christian and as a Christian leader in terms of advice about tattoos and piercings is that you ought to think it through and you ought to be old enough to understand the long-term relationship that you're likely going to have with that ink. And you ought to recognize that some people, and unfortunately Christians included, some people will be judgmental. But that's really all I can say about it. And for the record, I don't care. I don't care if you have tattoos or not. It makes me no difference at all. Unless it's vulgar or in some way draws attention to a more modest part of your body that ought not to be an attention getter for anybody but your spouse, I don't care. But now here's where I open the can of worms based on Scripture in Leviticus. Of course that text in Leviticus should give us pause. It has the word tattoo in it. But unless you're cutting yourself or getting a tattoo for the dead as some part of a pagan ritual, I don't think that you're sinning in getting a tattoo. In that time, it was very clearly a heathen practice. Now, there may be some places where it still is, and if that's the case, you ought not to be involved in that either. God simply wanted his people to stand apart and to be set apart. Nowadays, I see guys with scriptures tattooed all over their body. They're not doing that for the dead, I don't think, in some kind of a heathen ritual. But here's where this is tough. A lot of Christians want the Bible to say tattoos are wrong because they think they're wrong. And oftentimes they think they're wrong because someone they respected taught them they were wrong. And this is where that can of worms gets opened even more. We're going to look at what the Scripture says about three things that are very highly emotionally charged subjects. Divorce, remarriage, and cohabitation. 
And I know that Christians want the Bible to say certain things about all three of these practices. It's likely, in fact, that everybody in the room here this morning has very strong feelings about all of these. I do too. But what I feel isn't nearly as important as what God says. Right? So even as we prepare to look at a lengthy biblical text, let me remind you of a very important truth, okay? We need to deal with these challenging issues, divorce, remarriage, and cohabitation. We need to deal with these so that we know the truth, but also so that those who come behind us will know the truth. We want to do all that we can to help people avoid living in disobedience and regret. But listen carefully. No matter what has happened in your life up to this very moment, whether you're talking about divorce or remarriage or cohabitation, I want you to know, listen to me, if you're in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you have trusted in Jesus, repented of your sin, if you've done that, you're forgiven. Okay? You're forgiven. You're free. Listen to these words from Romans 8. There is therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'm not condemning. I'm just teaching, okay? Elephants in the room, divorce, remarriage, cohabitation. We find ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning with the first verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's page 955 if you're going to utilize one of the pew Bibles. And I invite you to stand as we read this word from the Lord together. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth as follows, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, please notice this is now in in, uh, quotation marks, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, end quote. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement, for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the believing husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is... They are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Thank you so much. You may be seated. Divorce, remarriage, cohabitation. We're in a series of sermons where we're talking about things that nobody wants to talk about, but in fact, somebody needs to talk about. We've already talked about the authority of the Bible. We talked for a couple of weeks about the sanctity of life. We talked for a couple of weeks about marriage. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. We talked about singleness. We talked about gambling, and we talked about depression. Remaining on the hit list are the following. We're going to talk about heaven and hell, burial and cremation, social media and how we speak, politics, suicide, Capital punishment, sexism, racism, gluttony, pornography, immigration, homosexuality, dating, money and giving, alcohol, marijuana, gender bending, gay marriage. We'll talk a bit about that today, as well as creation and evolution. And we probably will also end up talking about the discipline of the Lord, as well as the discipline of the church, if Jesus doesn't return before this series is over. 
So mainly there are three subjects under the umbrella of two main perspectives. We're going to deal with some of this today. Next week, we're having our spring renewal week, and Don Witzel will be preaching in all three of our morning services. And then in two weeks, we're going to finish what we're starting today, Lord willing, as Dr. Marshall taught us to say. So based on what the scripture records, we're going to see, first of all, what is permitted, and secondly, what is forbidden, what is permitted, and what is forbidden. So let's dig in. First of all, I want you to recognize this morning that marriage under certain conditions is permitted. Marriage under certain conditions is permitted. Now I know that those of you who are married or here this morning, you said, I'm so glad to know that marriage is permitted. Verses one and two, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, end quote, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Some in the church at Corinth had written to the Apostle Paul because there were evidently some who were in fact believers who had developed the idea that sexual relations of any kind, even within the covenant of marriage, would not be right. If we're not careful, we will misread what is said here, and we will think that Paul is saying from the Lord that it is good for a man not to marry. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying it's good for a man not to marry, at least not in this verse. Look at the text again. When Paul says it is good for a man not to marry, or some translations will say it is good for a man not to have sexual relations, he is referencing what the people have written to him, what they were asking him regarding. That was a catchphrase. It is good for a man not to marry. That was a catchphrase. That was a bumper sticker, if you will, in the day and time in which the church at Corinth was here writing. Paul is not saying that's the case. In fact, Paul quickly and quite clearly refutes the notion with what he will say afterward. But this doesn't mean that marriage under all circumstances would necessarily be permitted. It is certainly permitted under certain circumstances, but not under every circumstance. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes as follows. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, what accord has Christ with Belial, or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Now obviously Paul's words as recorded here in 2 Corinthians are not a play-by-play -play about the marriage relationship only. You should apply these verses that Paul has written, you should apply these to countless situations in your everyday life. For example, if you go into a business partnership with a pagan, you can mark it down, you're not going to share the same ethos nor the same ethic, and there will most likely be trouble somewhere along the way. But certainly, when it comes to the most important decision an individual will ever make outside of trusting in the Lord Jesus, the most important decision that is to marry another human being, certainly this is part of what is necessary to be on the same page. Being equally yoked, certainly marriage would fit into what Paul perhaps had in mind. There's no doubt it's a big, big deal. So in fact, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Believers can't in that way be yoked with unbelievers. If that's already the case, you can't unscramble eggs. But if you're on the front side of this and you don't have to marry an unbeliever or go into a lifelong partnership of sorts and business, etc., with an unbeliever, then you need to give that considerable cause and pause and prayer. It's pretty clear. Don't expect that the man or the woman that you're dating who is apathetic or perhaps even hostile to the things of God, don't expect them to suddenly change just because you stand before somebody and say, I do. It could happen, but in all likelihood, it will not happen. I know this is going to be hard for everybody to believe, but what you see is what you get. And in all likelihood, they won't change in that regard. Further, what our country now calls marriage, God does not recognize. God's plan is for one man and one woman for life. Now I know these days that in a lot of places that statement that I've just made would cause people to view me as bigoted 
or mean-spirited, certainly I would be recognized as a hate monger. Just last week, Baptist Press shared a story about Gateway Seminary. Gateway Seminary is one of our six Southern Baptist seminaries. It's located in Ontario, California. Facebook refused to, po to boost a post from Gateway Seminary where the school was simply describing the Bible as the ultimate authority in life. And Facebook wouldn't allow Gateway to boost that post. The article in question mentioned abortion and gender issues and polygamy, and Facebook did not boost it because at the time they said they had concerns that Gateway Seminary was a hate group. The seminary's article was about how following the teachings of the Scripture are important and how not following them will have a negative domino effect upon our culture. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Because we still believe the kinds of principles, and listen, I've read history, I know that not everybody that helped to start America, I know they weren't all Christians, I know some were atheists, some were deists, but some were followers of Christ, I know that. But because we still believe the kinds of principles upon which the United States of America was founded, we, even you in the church, you are potentially seen as a hate group. Can you imagine that? And nowhere is this rhetoric any hotter than within the debate over gay marriage. And even in the churches, there are people who say, the world has changed. You've got to change with it. The world is changed. We're evolving. We don't see things the way we used to. And you, as the church, you better change. You better go along to get along, or you're going to be left behind. I've watched our United Methodist friends debating this issue, and it has been deeply disturbing to me. Their general conference was held in St. Louis not long ago, and the church voted to ultimately stick with what they're calling the traditional plan, and kudos to them for doing so. As I understand it, it was the delegates from Africa and a few other places, not the delegates in the United States, that caused the United Methodist vote to affirm the traditional plan. The traditional plan reaffirms the Methodist view that, quote, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. You ought to pray for your Bible-believing Methodist friends. They're a gift to their denomination. It sharpened prohibitions of pastors from marrying same-sex couples and Methodist churches from hosting such unions. It indicates that United Methodists who are in same-sex marriages are on the wrong side of the Scriptures. Adam Hamilton, who leads Church of the Resurrection in Kansas, which I believe anyway, is the largest United Methodist Church in America. Reverend Hamilton has been an outspoken critic of the United Methodist Church sticking to their biblical roots regarding the concept that same-sex couples should not be married and that the church should not host their weddings and so forth, Hamilton said, and I quote, this idea is repugnant. In other words, he more closely aligns with the liberals in Washington than Jesus of Nazareth. It has been nothing short of painful watching Reverend Hamilton, a well-read, well-educated, articulate, winsome man try to jump through hermeneutical hoops attempting to change what the Scripture says about such an important topic. Rather than be grateful that his general conference affirmed the Bible, he's on a propaganda campaign to discredit those who made the decision. He said of the African delegation, who literally sent it over the top, in my mind, who saved the United Methodist Church for now. According to Hamilton, the reason they're against homosexuality is because homosexuality is against the law in their country. I'll bet, I'll bet, if you ask them, they will tell you they're against it, not because it's against the law in their country, but because it's against the law in the Scriptures. Part of Reverend Hamilton's rationalization for supporting same-sex unions is because he notes that some 75% of millennials support same-sex marriage. Okay. All due respect to our millennials among us. They don't get the final vote. 
And listen to me, you don't either. God does. I'm not against the Methodists at all. I'm a Baptist, and you know if you followed anything, we've got more than our share of stuff to deal with. I'm not about to throw stones. I have a lot of friends who are Methodist. I'm just saying that some of them are believing the lie because the world is changing and they're thinking that the the view of the church related to morals has to change as well. Listen carefully. When somebody says to you the church has to change, after all, the world is changing, therefore the church has to... No, we don't. We don't. We don't have to change, and I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we will change on those things to our own demise. You can't change biblical principles if you want to be right with God. Not to be blunt, but to be concise, let me simply say that gay marriage is not acceptable in the eyes of God. I'm not saying that we don't accept gay people as created in the image of God. We do. Every person, gay, straight, every person is an image bearer of God. They've been created in the very image of God. Gay people matter to God. Gay people are not less than in any way. But like any other ongoing, unrepentant, sinful lifestyle, whether that's adultery of the straight form or adultery of the gay form, any kind of unrepentant, ongoing, sinful lifestyle, we have to love people enough to share the truth with them. So I'm simply saying, while we should be loving and caring toward all people, that does not equate to laying your biblical convictions on the altar of cultural conformity. I love gay people, and I'm not condescending when I say this. I feel sorry for them. And I know that sounds condescending, And I'm not condescending when I say it. I feel sorry for them because, first of all, same-sex attraction is not a temptation with which I have battled. So I don't know how difficult that must be. But obviously it is. Secondly, I feel sorry for them because if they give in and they choose to do this, they have bought the lie of the enemy and they've bought the lie of the culture. And that makes me very sad for them. There's another lie people buy into, and it's the idea of serial monogamy. They think that if they marry someone of the opposite sex, and they're faithful to them for as long as they choose to remain married, and then they decide to divorce and then marry somebody else, and they're faithful to them as long as they decide to be faithful to them until they decide to divorce, that that's enough. But it's not. Marriage is not about being faithful for a time and then moving on when things get tough to be faithful with someone else for a time and so forth. It's not just, I'll be faithful to the wife to whom I married until I choose to leave her and marry someone else to whom I will pledge faithfulness and be faithful until she does something of which I disapprove. Now, some of you guys are not believers, and I want you to know why we believe this. We're not being ugly or judgmental. We're just trying to help people be faithful to God. That's it. When we make a big deal about believers and marriage and what God would constitute as acceptable marriage, it's because we're simply trying to help people do things the right way. That's all. I'm not judging anybody. I don't dislike people who disagree with me. In fact, I can tell you this morning, I don't hate anybody in any camp related to all of this. I'm just trying to help people by teaching them the Bible. So marriage under certain conditions is permitted. Not only marriage under certain conditions is permitted, but secondly, divorce under certain conditions is permitted. Look with me at verse 15. But the unbelieving partner, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Paul is here talking about a situation where a believer has been married to an unbeliever. And he says that if the unbeliever leaves, then the believer is not bound, or as some will say, is not enslaved. We'll see later on that not only does he mean the believer doesn't have to stay married, but I believe he indicates that he or she is also free to, in fact, remarry. So what exactly would be grounds for divorce? We know that sex some kind of sexual relationship outside of marriage would be. We know that adultery certainly would be. Jesus mentions this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. 
We'll get to the latter part of that verse later on, but since he mentions sexual immorality as the exception clause, it's clear he's indicating that divorce is permissible when sexual immorality has occurred. Even if the marriage vow is broken, however, let me be quick to say divorce is only an option. It's not a requirement. Just because the vow has been broken doesn't mean that divorce has to occur, but it does mean that biblically it would be justified if it does occur. In fact, I could tell you of several couples in my lifetime with whom I have counseled after they've experienced infidelity, and I want you to know in several instances they've made it. So it's not a requirement to divorce, but it is an option. If you're a Christian and your spouse is not a Christian, you are not bound to the marriage relationship if your spouse leaves. Desertion, then, without question, is also grounds for biblically justifiable divorce. If you're married to an unbeliever, do your best to stay in the relationship as you might possibly be the one to help lead your spouse to Christ. But if your spouse leaves, hear me, you're free. You're free. Now, for some of you, what I'm about to say might seem like a bit of a slippery slope, but I feel like it has to be said. Well, I realize that in today's culture in particular, it is quite difficult to define the concept of abuse. I want you to know that if real abuse is present, I don't believe, I don't believe that an individual is bound to stay in that kind of marriage relationship. If a man is abusing his wife, he's breaking the law. That law-breaking should cause an action whereby he is removed from the home. Certainly, if he is removed from the home because of his actions, his actions have caused him to most certainly desert his wife. But whether or not the law steps in and he is removed from the home, I still believe, for all intents and purposes, he has deserted her. At the very least, he is breaking his marriage vow to love, honor, cherish, etc. Further, and by the way, this is not meant to heap guilt upon anybody, but rather to help you see there can be a way out. Further, if one stays in a truly abusive relationship, I will say she, because most often that would be the case, she could in fact be breaking another commandment of the Lord. The scripture says, love your neighbor as your Self, correct? So one of the first tenets of self-love is self-care and ultimately self-preservation. You cannot be taking care of yourself, loving yourself, and fulfilling this command if you're allowing yourself to be beaten on at regular intervals. Further, Paul encourages married couples to freely give conjugal rights to each other He says this in chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. So he says that you are to give yourself physically, that is intimately, that is sexually to one another. And you ought to do that because, he says, the husband's body doesn't belong to him, the wife's body doesn't belong to her. In chapter 7, verse 32, I want us to take note of something as well. Look with me there, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32. Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. He's concerned about, he's he's dealing with the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, or he's concerned about worldly things. He's focused on worldly things, that is, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, is what Paul says at this point. He's talking about being free from anxiety. He's talking about being free from so-called worldly things. He's referencing things like the need to provide. If you're a husband, you're called upon to provide for the basic needs of your spouse and your family. You have to provide food and clothing to a spouse. Although he doesn't explicitly state it here at this point, many would say that Paul is inferring that neglect through desertion as well as neglect by not giving themselves to each other sexually, as well as the husband not providing for the basic needs of the wife, some would say Paul is referencing all of these as potential for divorce, biblically justified divorce. If a wife or a husband refuses to have sexual relations with one another, Paul would be saying 
that that could potentially be grounds for divorce. The same thing with abuse, the same thing with desertion. But it's important that I offer a quick caveat and recognize that in some cases due to illness or disability, some partners may not be able to function sexually or perhaps some partners may not even be able to provide for the basic needs of the other. Common sense and a broad-based biblical understanding would dictate Paul is talking about those who can but who simply choose not to. You understand the difference. All of this, I believe, harkens back to Exodus 21, verses 10 and 11. I'll let you explore that on your own because of time constraints. It's a little different context, but it deals with the importance of providing food and clothing and conjugal rights. Certainly unfaithfulness would be easy to identify as grounds for divorce, but you can imagine the rabbis were loath to allow divorce on the ground of refusing conjugal activity. It's a little bit more difficult to define, is it not? For example, how often is enough? How often should a married couple maintain intimacy with one another? And isn't the idea even of conjugal or marital rights even more than simply sexual activity? If a man never shows his wife affection but has sex with her several times a week, is he really fulfilling all of her needs? What's well, an obvious answer, and the answer is no. And what about the requirement for the man to provide for his wife's necessities? A man could buy food and clothing for his wife and provide a place to live these days, but if he would restrict his wife from having dinner with her friends or buying makeup or buying magazines or uh, bracelets, <laughs> is he really providing for all of her needs? And again, the answer is no. So Paul says divorce under certain conditions is permitted. Moses, long before Paul, by the way, said the same thing. Mark 10, verses 2 through 4, And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, that is to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And that's true. Moses did that very thing. Jesus goes on to say it was because of the hardness of their hearts that God, in fact, made this concession. God did not want a woman to be left alone, victimized, to have to fend for herself without any positive prospect for the future. So allowing divorce would, in fact, give her a clean break, ostensibly in order that she might, in turn, remarry. And we'll get to that concept in two weeks. So marriage under certain conditions is permitted. Divorce under certain conditions is permitted. Even as I've had to say some difficult things this morning, I want you to know that no one, no one living within the forgiveness of Christ should feel condemnation, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter what you've experienced. Everybody in this room has sinned, right? In fact, your spouses have told me about your sin. <laughs> and I want you to know, I always want to be, and I always want our church to be part of the process of healing that is applying grace to the wounds of those who are hurting. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a minute. We're not going to do anything new age, but if you're comfortable closing your eyes for a moment, I want to simply read to you as I close, these beautiful lyrics from a song called Wounded Soldier. And I want you to think about the people you know who have been hurt by divorce, by some things perhaps that have been said about their divorce or their remarriage, or those that have been hurt because they've lived with someone else or because of what people perhaps have said about them. I want you to think about those people as I read these words. See all the wounded. Hear their desperate cries for help. They're pleading for shelter and for peace. Our comrades are suffering. Come let us meet them at their needs. Don't let a wounded soldier die. Come, let us pour the oil. Come, let us bind their hurt. 
Let's cover them with a blanket of His love. Come, let us break the bread. Come, let us give them rest. Let's minister healing to them. Don't let another wounded soldier die. Obeying their orders, they fought on the front lines for the king, tearing down enemy strongholds. Then weakened from battle, Satan crept in to kill their lives. But don't let another soldier die. Come, let us pour the oil. Come, let us bind their hurt. Let's cover them with a blanket of His love. Come, let us break the bread. Come, let us give them rest. Let's minister healing to them. Don't let another wounded soldier die.